My name is Greg Kuda. Uh, I did not get up today at 5.30 as I was sleeping at the Marriott down the street, so I'm, I'm well rested. Let's see here. So I work with the softwood lumber industry in developing risk management strategies. Uh, I deal with the full spectrum of clientele. I deal with eastern and western spruce producers. I deal with wholesale distribution wholesale transit guys, I deal with pro retailers, I deal with small contract type yards, uh, I deal with home builders and everything in between. In addition to dealing with the softwood lumber industry, uh, I also deal with the institutional side of the equation. I consult with commodity funds, I trade with commodity funds. I think it's imperative to understand the other side of the equation in that when you think lumber is a buy or a sell, there's somebody that could have a, an opinion 180 degrees from that, and it's the funds. And the funds become the 800-pound gorilla in the room and that they can cause massive price disruptions when they decide to come plowing into lumber. Uh, I, I just want to talk about risk management, speculation, risk management versus speculation, know thyself, and the characteristics of what makes a good risk management program. Uh, I, I, I think... The idea of developing a risk management program is that it should complement your traditional cash business. It's not there to take over. It's a secondary market that you should utilize in that if there is a discount or a premium in the futures market and I'd like to do something with my traditional cash business and I can't do that, can I use futures to mitigate that risk, to take advantage of the disruption in pricing? Uh, So risk management 101, I, I think this is imperative in that as an industry, we tend to look at the industry's perceived risk. If you're going to develop a program, it has to be unique to you. You have to look at your own risk. Go walk through your own yard and see where the inherent risk is. Is the risk for you, the market going up $50 a thousand, or is it the risk going down $50 a thousand? I think we have a tendency to say, well, this is a basis opportunity for the industry. I have no idea. Look at your own business. When is your consumption? How do you churn inventory? And, and I think those are things that are critical in developing a program. The blanket approach does not work. You have to develop a customized program for you. Uh, you know, the other thing that makes a success, uh, successful program is crystal clear directive of who the decision makers are. Ideally, CEO, CFO, sales manager, somebody that has direct authority to make a decision. Is it going to be decision by committee? Uh, who's in charge? I think that's critical. You have to determine that up front. What are your objectives? What are your trading objectives? What are you trying to accomplish? Are you hedging or are you speculating? And the reason I ask that is that a lot of people say that we're hedging only if we make money on both sides. That's technically not a hedge. As what Candace discussed earlier, what Ashley discussed earlier, risk management is you make money on one side of the equation, the cash, you lose money on the other side. If you make money on futures, it's a sad day because you're losing money on the cash side of the business. So be honest with yourself and what you're trying to use futures for. It's okay to speculate, but know that up front that you're speculating. Uh, you know, these are some of the things that Ashley... Uh, and the CME discussed here, price protection insurance, production inventory management. Uh, you know, I'm not going to get too detailed into this because it's already been discussed. Uh, basis trading, the idea of you have the spot cash price versus the futures. Can you take advantage of a premium against the lower cash price? Uh, forward pricing is basically buying something in the futures to take advantage of knowing that you're going to have to buy that inventory at a later date. Um, EFPs, lumber delivery, you know, Eastern Mills can EFP into the CME futures. They cannot deliver, but they can EFP, and they do. And so this goes, and I, I know Candace spoke about this a little bit, but this is, I'm oh, sorry. Uh, there's the laser. Um, I think, I feel like I should be pointing at cats here. Um, uh, so here's, Western SPF mill versus Eastern Great Lakes versus Boston. This is just all two by fours. You can see there's a strong correlation, similarity in patterns. This is just a 2000. I have charts that go back into the 90s. There's a strong correlation between Western SPF, that's the 
futures market is a derivation of the Western SPF mill. Uh, and then I also have, I'm, I'm a big econometrics, uh, uh, financial mathematics guy. So here's a correlation study between futures, Western SPF, Boston, and Eastern Great Lakes, two by fours. Here's also a positive correlation between futures and Western SPF. And you can see, uh, let's see here. So correlation between futures and Western SPF is about 92%. Between futures and Boston, two by fours is about an 89%. Eastern Great Lakes is about an 89%. This is a 95% confidence level. There's high correlation. Now, you can also look at this based upon seasonality, Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4, and you can fine tune this correlation even more. So I can look at, you know, again, when's my consumption? When's my usage? Am I going to buy something in the fall? and I'm in the upper Midwest, and I'm going to sit on that until April 15th when my you know, business starts to kick in. You can look at, you know, on a quarterly basis, and you can get higher correlation numbers. You can also do correlation, have correlation studies on 6-inch, 10-inch, narrows, wides, MSR, uh, studs, and you, you can kind of look at the hardcore numbers to see if there's an actual basis or a hedge opportunity specific to you based upon how you're consuming the wood. So this is just a, a simple multiple linear regression where futures is a dependent variable. And all the this, you take away from this is that, let's see if I can do the pointer. So futures for a $1 move in futures, statistically there's a, a, a dollar two move in spruce. There's a 98 cent move in Boston. There's a dollar five move in Great Lakes. It's a one to one move. So a $1 move in futures, there's a high correlation there's going to be a dollar move in those underlying cash markets. So here's a seasonal cash chart from more research. This shows a 30-year pattern, a 15-year pattern, a 5-year pattern. You can see that historically lumber tops out in February and March. We're in February and March. Uh, and then you have a strong seasonal pattern where you decrease, I'm sorry, you sell off into the basically May-June period. You have a rally into August, September. You make the seasonal lows in October, November, the 40th, 42nd week of the year. And then you have the run-up uh, into Q1. Uh, Houston, we have a problem here. OK, there we go. Uh, same thing with seasonal futures chart. I'm not going to dwell too much on that because it's very similar to the cash chart. So this is a more simplistic version of what I just showed you. This shows the relationship between inventory and price relationship. The black line is basically the trend in cash. I'm sorry, can you go back? Thank you. Um, so February, March is typically historically when we peak out. This is when you, have, you should be selling liquidating inventory. You should be buying inventory in the May-June time period selling the inventory in August, September, and then this is the big inventory accumulation period in October, December. And then that green line basically is a 20-year average on Western SPF 2 by 4s uh, And then also on this chart, you can see the actual expiration months, and that kind of gives you, you know, how it falls to where the market, you know, if you look at March expiration, you make the high, usually around the third week of February, you have a secondary high into March expiration, and then you have that seasonal sell-off into June. Yes, please. So contango versus backwardization. I'm not going to dwell on this too much. I'm not going to get too technical. But this basically tells us here's the spot. Here's cash. Here's futures trading at a premium. Here's futures trading at a discount. As you move to maturity, this is maturity, you get the convergence between cash and futures. Next chart, please. So. This is another simplistic way of looking at contango versus backwardization. So here's a bear market structure versus a bull market structure. Uh, does this pattern look familiar? Here's cash at 360. You have prompt wood wholesalers asking 351 in that range. You have futures trading at a premium. You know, they're not at 375 today, they're at 370. And so the further along the price curve you go, you trade at a bigger premium. Now, I'm not going to say it's a bear market structure, 
but it's not a positive structure. A bull market structure is where you have the greatest interest in prompt wood, and then as you go down the price curve, you fall back to discounts. So this structure is representative of housing topping out in 2008 and what we've been accustomed to since. So are we shifting from a bear market? We're probably in a neutral market structure. We can make the case that housing's now shifting into a bull market structure. You'll know it's a bull market structure when you see this, where you see cash trading at a premium and then futures trading at a discount to cash. Next slide, please. So if you look at the last four futures expirations, we've had this pattern of futures collapsing to a discount relative to cash. And then the next month out, bottoms. And then you know, if you look at September expiration, September bottomed out at a discount. November was trading at a premium. November proceeded to rally $40. I can't see $44. November expiration, January bottomed out into November expiration. November rallied $34. January expiration, March bottomed out, rallied $63. And then you had just had the March expiration at 340.90, May bottomed out at 56.90, and has since rallied $23. Do you see a pattern there? Uh, next slide, please. So, what are the characteristics of a bull bear market? Um, I think a bull, with bull market, you see a big, large increase in open interest. A declining open interest structure is not bullish; it's bearish. So, you'll know you're in a bull market structure when you see a big build in open interest. I'll show you the uh, CME open interest chart that Candace showed earlier. You know, lumber at 7,000 to 10,000 open interest, that's a bull market structure. Lumber at 3,500 to 5,000 open interest, that's not an encouraging structure. So you need to shift. So the, the, the concept of a bull market is that you have a, a, a excessive long speculation, i.e. the funds, guys that are caught short cash come plowing in because they have to own anything. They buy the market bid it up, and there gives you your bull market structure. Okay, next slide, please. So a bear market structure, declining futures open interest. Uh, you get speculative long liquidation. The funds get blown out. You get commercial short covering because they don't see the downside risks, so they buy back their shorts. Uh, futures front month trades at a discount to cash. Next slide. Uh, supply side, so uh, the idea of supply side versus demand side bull markets. A supply-side driven market results in a constraint on production of some sort. You have a supply disruption. It could be log deck shortages, rail car shortages, does this sound familiar? Uh, forest fires, SLA. Usually you get a short-term explosive exponential move to the upside. You get violent price swings. Prices are inelastic because at the end of that move, you have to have the underlying fundamentals support those higher numbers. If the fundamentals don't ratchet up to support it, prices tumble over and fall back to fair market value. Uh, next slide, please. So a demand-driven bull market, these are a lot easier to trade because they're elastic and sustainable. You have good underlying demand. Prices creep higher. Think of the stair step higher. You go up $30 a thousand. You pull back 10 to 15. You go up $30 repeat that cycle because you have good underlying demand. The underlying fundamentals support that kind of market. Uh, next slide. So examples of market analysis tools. These are some of the things that I think are relevant and that I use and I think might be of interest. Uh, next slide. So here's long-term monthly lumber futures in Can converted into Canadian dollars. So if you're a mill, your return, depending on the contract right now, is anywhere from 460, to, I'm sorry, 460 to $500 a thousand. You've come a long way since the 300 area here back in 2015. You're back at 20, uh, I'm sorry, 2005 levels. You're back at the housing peak uh, uh, levels for returns to Canadian mills. Now, obviously, we all know that's going to change here on the 24th in some, for, for some form, some fashion. but. Canadian mills should be highly profitable because of the exchange rate right now. Next chart, please. So this is Western SPF 2x4 prices since 1995. I apologize for uh, uh, the, the small print there. But basically, this is just looking at the last random length, all, all the weekly prints since 1995. And looking at a $330 threshold to 400. And this is the percent of times 
the amount of time that we've spent at these levels. So to be at $330 a thousand, you're there about 36% of the time. To be between 350 and 370, we're at 360 right there. You know, right now, you're, you're somewhere between 27 to 18%. Uh, to be above 385, you're there 13%. To be at $400 a thousand, 10% of the time. You're not there that long. And you can see by this chart, when you do get there, these are usually supply-driven constraint markets. They're not demand-driven. You get massive disruptions, volatility, uh, explosive violent moves to the upside with explosive violent corrections back to the downside. Next chart, please. Okay. Uh, here's the same thing with futures. Uh, futures, you can see, to be above 400, you're there 4% of the time. To be above 385, you're there 7% of the time. Next chart, please. Here's starts. Starts have retraced 50%. So what are the headwinds for housing? What are the tailwinds for housing? How will higher uh, 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 land costs, uh, labor constraint, higher interest rate structure, how's that going to impact housing? I don't know. That I, I'm asking. I don't know. But see, there's some of the things that are going to potentially influence housing. Next chart. Permits, uh, same, same uh, uh, price uh, pattern. Next chart. Canadian housing starts. Uh, next chart. Sorry to run through this, but I'm running out of time. Uh, CME, Candace referenced this. This is a daily publication from the CME. It gives you lumber volume, futures, open interest. Go to the website and look at this yourself. It gives you the, all the option stuff. Gives you the highs, the lows, the volume. Next chart. CFT Commitment of Traders Report. This gives you a breakdown of commercials versus non-commercials. This tells you what the funds are doing. Next chart. So here's total open interest. This is the chart Candace had. You can see bull market structure, bear market structure. We're coming out of a bear market structure with open interest. Next chart. Commercial shorts, you just had the spike in pricing up to 388. You can see shorts, the mill started to aggressively sell to capture order file here. Next chart. Commodity fund longs, who took the other side of that? Funds started to buy the momentum. Here's the funds. Next chart. So here's the percent of funds, fund longs, and commercial shorts. You can see when the fund longs get above 50%, you're usually at a saturation point that you can only be as big as the underlying given market. You can only buy so many contracts. If the market doesn't grow, you reach a saturation point where you know the funds are done buying. When their bids disappear, the fundamentals don't back it up. You come crashing back down to reality with the fund liquidation. Next chart. So reasons to use lumber futures as a risk management tool, price protection, right, uh, reduction of risk, you can increase market share without increasing your exposure. It's the liquid part of your inventory. You might not like the price, but you're always able to buy and sell in the futures market. Less working capital. With cash, you have 100% cash outlay. Futures, there's that margin requirement that Candace referenced. And the most important thing, you might not be using it, but your competition is. I guarantee it. Uh, that being said, uh, I appreciate the Montreal Wood Convention for giving me the opportunity to speak. If there's any questions, uh, I'm more than happy to ask or answer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Greg. There's a little present. Oh, thank you. Est-ce qu'il y a des questions pour uh, Greg? Any questions for Greg? Thank you. No. Uh, oui, Laurent, encore. Merci, Laurent. Chance que tu es là. Uh, question maybe for Greg or also for Philip. Uh, it may seem complicated going in that, that kind of uh, tools there, but uh, question is for both. Uh, people here will be interested in getting in. Uh, what will be the next step? How, how, how do they jump in? Who, who, who do, should they call? Or well, you should call me, but uh, <laughs> uh, 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 see that, write that number down. Uh, uh, no, I, I, I think you can give very specific answers, but to give you generalistic concepts and ideas, I, you have to know what your underlying business is and what you're trying to protect against from a risk standpoint. Where is your specific risk based upon that, based, a bit, based upon uh, you know, the species you're trading, uh, the items that you're producing or the items that you're churning, you can develop very specific strategies based upon that and you can start with low risk type stuff like options, you can use futures outright, you can give very specific examples and then you can see 
how those examples play out and then if it makes sense for you. I, again, I, I think you don't run a sawmill without a saw. You don't run a, a, yard, a, a contractor yard without a forklift. So futures is just another tool in the toolbox. And does it mean that you use it every day? No. But are there big enough price disruptions to warrant at least looking at futures? I, I think absolutely. Because what Philip said, you know, if, if, and this is my opinion, but I've seen enough with the other physical commodities that trade on the CME, commercial uh, 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 participation is 80% plus in pretty much every other physical commodity. When you look at lumber, it's at 10 to 20%. I think that there's a stigma attached to futures that, oh my God, it could explode in my face. It's no less riskier than what you're doing in, under, in the underlying cash if used properly. If the idea is to mitigate the risk. Ben, moi, ce que je rajouterais à ça, ce qui est, euh, euh, puis, euh, c'est quand je vais dans une usine, euh, je, je, vois tout, je vois toute l'automatisation, je vois toute la technologie, je vois tout les, ce que les ingénieurs font, qui est absolument impressionnant, mais je ne comprends pas tout à fait ça, mais je sais que ça sert à sauver de l'argent. Ils vont sauver 5 piastres, 10 piastres, 15 piastres, 20 piastres, 10 000 en faisant ça. Moi, ce que, quand je regarde ça, ça me passionne, ça me fascine. Je suis très familier avec les concepts qui sont là, je suis à l'aise là-dedans. Mais c'est aussi, pour la fin de l'année, augmenter le mille net, ça peut servir à l'augmenter de 20, 25, 30, 40, profiter d'opportunités, parfois qui sont là dans le marché, euh, qui ne coûtent pas nécessairement cher à capturer. Tandis que quand tu investis dans ton usine, il faut que tu investisses des millions pour aller sauver euh, dans les, des coûts de production. Il y a ces opportunités-là dans les, dans les futures, dans les produits financiers. Euh, et euh, la façon de le faire, je pense que, Either you contact the, the CME and they direct you to others. Ashley does some of it. Greg does some of it. Wholesale distributors do uh, some of that uh, risk management for producers and customers. So there's a bunch of people who are absolutely passionate about uh, this stuff and uh, who can uh, help you and guide you uh, through this. Moj, I have peut-être maybe one question before we. I was curious just who uses kind of futures or what we've heard here today. Who uses that in their managing their, their daily business. Raise your hand if you're not uh, abided by confidentiality rules. So, few people. Uh, okay, so. Uh, uh, and I have one question also. Who's right. using uh, uh, risk management risk for, uh, risk management tools for uh, exchange rate? U.S. dollar? Few more. more. That's not more complicated there. It's, 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 it's the same. The same. And perhaps after this, maybe the question is who will plan on possibly using uh, risk management for their uh, future business. Raise your hands if you, if this has changed, moved the needle at all. Okay, continued education is what we need. Uh, so we're moving to a different topic. Thank you very much. Thanks, I appreciate Greg. it. Um,